This week on Wealth Track, the current culture of value investing from Ben Graham's and Warren Buffett's former brokerage firm. A Wealth Track exclusive with Tweedy Brown's Will Brown and John Spears is next on Consuelo Mack Wealth Track. Funding provided by Clearbridge Investments, a Leg Mason company, Thornburg Investment Management, Active Management, Flexible Perspective, Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences, and the Fairholm Foundation. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. Wall Street is haunted by the ghosts of brokerage firms past. In my career alone, multiple firms, including established names such as Dean Witter, Kidder Peabody, Payne Weber, and Smith Barney, were thriving independents. No more. Even the Merrill Lynch name is being gradually erased by parent company Bank of America. Well, there is one old line firm still standing, however, with an impeccable investment pedigree that is carrying on its deep-rooted value traditions. It is Tweedy Brown, which was founded in 1920, had offices in the same Wall Street building as Benjamin Graham's firm, and became his broker. Graham, of course, is considered to be the father of value investing, having authored The Intelligent Investor, recognized as the definitive book on value investing, which Warren Buffett, a lifetime student of Graham's, calls the best book about investing ever written. In fact, Tweedy Brown also became Warren Buffett's broker and helped him quietly acquire shares of Berkshire Hathaway in the 1960s. Buffett writes favorably about the firm's approach and track record in his famous essay, The Super Investors of Graham and Doddsville, which is included in a revised edition of The Intelligent Investor. In a WealthTrack exclusive, we are joined by two of Tweedy Brown's longtime portfolio managers. William Brown is portfolio manager, managing director, and member of the investment committee, has been with the firm since 1978, and is a member of the Brown family. A committed value investor, he is on the executive advisory board of the Heilbrunn Center for Graham and Dodd Investing at Columbia University. John Spears is also a portfolio manager and investment committee member, and he joined the firm in 1974. Although they are both traditional long-term value investors, there is nothing old-fashioned about their performance. The flagship Tweedy Brown Global Value Fund, which they have co-managed since its 1993 inception, was named Morningstar International Fund Manager of the Year in both 2000 and 2011. It carries five-star and bronze medalist ratings and is ranked in the top 2% of its foreign large value category for the last five years, the top 1% for the past 15-year periods, and the top 6% for the past 20. It has also beaten the market and its peers since inception. Buffett's partner, Charlie Munger, once described Tweedy Brown as absolute descendants of Ben Graham. They are like Buddhists or Tibetan monks who absolutely bought into the catechism. Well, I asked Brown and Spears if they agreed with that characterization. I think that's, that's accurate with a little bit of a caveat that we've continued to evolve and learn things from other people, especially from Warren Buffett and, and, and Charlie Munger. But, uh, uh, you know, in my, my case, I've read the 1934 edition of Security Analysis, the mm -hmm. 1936 edition. Uh, he just, he's a fabulous writer, brilliant man, and, and uh, we, owe him, we owe him a lot. So how would you describe, Will, your, your style of value investing? And well, what I would add to what John said is, it, and to some extent it, it surprises me, I think that um, whether the people honestly believe it or not, there's still a tendency to reduce this whole idea of value investing down to a couple of simple quantitative metrics. I guess the um, popular phrase today right. is factors, you know, price to book PE. Um, I think that that is really a very incomplete definition of what this process is about. And the process really derives from, we refer to it in, in our firm as Graham's big idea, and that is, and I think most people are familiar with it, you're buying, when you buy a share of stock, you're buying a fractional interest in a business. Mm -hmm. If you accept that framework, 
then that's going to drive everything that you do every day when you come to the office. The, the, the mantra around our office is think like an owner. Put the ownership hat on and ask yourself, there's a share of stock trading out there. It's a business. What's it worth? And try and find some reasonable parameters for estimating that value. Then you look into the marketplace and say, have we got a spread? Because the idea of still buying something for less than what it's worth I think is a good idea. Mm -hmm. As we all know, businesses have become more asset light. And right. we all know that Warren has evolved over the years. He's buying good businesses. I think a lot of what we do are also good businesses. It's a, quite a broad mix. The best thing you can do is buy into a very good business at a very attractive price, capture the spread, and then keep the compound and be able to stay with it for a long, long period of time so that you don't have to pay off your silent partner who is the tax man mm -hmm. when you sell. My understanding is, you know, given what Will just said as well, that there's been an evolution at Tweedy Brown. Can you describe the evolution of, of your value investing approach? In terms of the evolution, I'd say that, you know, if you go back to 1974 or 1975, well, the economy was different. There were more manufacturing businesses. Right. And you, you could find companies sometimes selling below their current assets, less all liabilities, and you buy that at two-thirds. It's a Ben Graham formula, and you get the property, plant, and equipment for free. And we had a number of those, but we also had things based on earnings power, like uh, the Binney and Smith, the Cran Company, uh, that would be based more on, 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 on business valuation, what, what a competitor might pay for mm -hmm. that kind of business, or timberland, or oil and gas businesses where you, you, you get a, a valuation framework for valuing that kind of a, a business. But as time moved on, those, those net current asset stocks became extinct. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, but the, ba the basic idea was still, you know, what's something really worth? Is it worth, a, if intrinsic value is $100 a share and you can buy it at 50, You've got uh, two to one, almost like collateral coverage, and you've got the prospect for a hundred percent gain if the fifty goes to to what it's worth. And uh, but uh, you know, being influenced by by Buffett and Munger, right. and uh, uh, seeing the importance of of free cash flow and compounding of the business, uh, definitely we've 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 evolved. But we still buy things that are very cheap on the numbers, and then. Uh, other things that were cheap on the numbers when we bought them generally and, and, and they compound, we hold on to them. When I look at some of the top holdings in the, in the Global Value Fund, for instance, I mean, they're, they're you know, well-known names, you know, Roche, Nestle, Diageo, Heineken, Novartis, mm -hmm. Zurich Insurance, Total. So, so what, what do they all have in common? Most of those companies have a, a great deal of stability in, in their, their income, a great deal of stability in, the, in their demand. And uh, they typically have products that are number one or number two mm -hmm. in, their, in their marketplace. So they have uh, strong competitive advantages and generally earn a higher return on capital than, than most businesses. And as a result, they have most of their earnings in cash and they can use right. that to buy other companies or buy back their own stock or pay pay a nice dividend and have some growth. Now that isn't, that isn't all of our companies. No. We, own, right. we own some average businesses that right. we might have bought at, uh, at uh, seven times earnings and uh, enterprise value to earnings before interest and taxes of you know, eight or seven or even five times and, uh, uh, and, and some below tangible book value, right. which so, is, is rare. I uh -huh. mean, you, there, but there are some out there, especially when your your uh, shopping aisle of uh, prospective opportunities is is global. Berkshire Hathaway, uh, one of your largest holding, or it's, I guess it's the largest holding in the value fund. Last that good management's done well. Right. Well, <laughs> it's lagged the market. The stock has for the last ten years. It's done it so a couple of times. Um, Buffett says he expects Berkshire's uh, stock to perform about the same as the S and P in the future, maybe a little bit better. What's your view, number one, of Berkshire Hathaway? Which one of you wants to respond first? Well, I think it's a, it's a, it's a very good, solid holding. And uh, 
it reminds me a little bit of uh, a quotation from Benjamin Graham. Benjamin Graham, when talking about the definition of, of, an, of investing, said in investment operations, one, that uh, upon thorough research and analysis promises safety of principle and a satisfactory return. Satisfactory. He didn't say a market beating return. He didn't say an alpha. Uh, and I think Berkshire Hathaway is, is one where, okay, you, do, you, you ended up in a 10 year period, you did a little bit worse than the S&P 500, but you're still up probably 200 some percent, maybe 300, I yeah. say. <laughs> and, uh, and it's a very diversified holding. And, and the basic ideas from the management of buying back the stock when it's, when it's way below its, its, their estimate of intrinsic value and, uh, and, and, and again, sitting with it and not paying taxes because you think it's going to compound is, is, is good. Yeah. To me, it's a better index fund than the index. Mm -hmm. yeah. A far better index fund than the index because you've had a person in there picking good businesses to put into his index and has been, I don't think anybody could question that he hasn't been prudent and thoughtful about how he's used his capital. Stock buybacks, there was an interesting uh, statistic mm. I saw recently that the market, the S&P 500 would be 20% lower than it is today were it not for stock buybacks. Right. Your view on the importance of stock buybacks to compounded you know, growth rates in the businesses that you own? If the stock is cheap, it's wonderful when they're buying mm -hmm. that stock. I mean, uh, if it stocks at 10 times earnings, so you've got a 10% earnings yield, if, you, if the company paid out all of its earnings as a dividend, well, if they, if they had enough cash to buy back 10% of the shares outstanding, basically, your earnings per share go up 10% as a result mm -hmm. of that, that move. And uh, you can have just tremendous increases in, in per share wealth and, and, and earnings and intrinsic value if a company's buying, buying back at, at cheap prices. Now, a lot of, that's key. A lot of, uh, yeah. of but the buybacks don't, I don't think, strike yeah. us as cheap. They're, yeah. and many of them seem to be offset, buying back enough shares to offset the dilution from stock option exercise. What do you worry about with stock buybacks? Well, one of the things that I do think about is that I, I, I sometimes wonder if how different the average manager in a business is from the average investor. You know, buy high, they don't sell low, but they don't buy. Um, you know, I think that people by and large in behavioral finance has, I think, provided a lot of data on this. Um, we're not well wired to make unemotional, disciplined decisions. Stock's going up, they feel good, they want to move up, the crowd, and there's pressure, and they do it. When the market swings the other way, there's a tendency to hunker down. I'm not going to buy it. I'm going to conserve my cash. I'm going to be careful. I've often thought that um, paying dividends is a far better test of a company's commitment because I think there's much more hesitancy to cut a dividend than there is to suspend the buyback. What company, John, exemplifies your style of investing, your approach to investing mm -hmm. in your portfolios? Is there one that stands one out that, that... that stands out? No, I'd say we, you know, we own 95 stocks. Mm -hmm. uh, I, so we, we, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mixture of, mm -hmm. of different kinds of valuations. You can have oil and gas companies, timber companies, uh, advertising agencies that uh, that basically have almost no no tangible uh, uh -huh. net assets. Uh, yep. uh, you can have banks. Uh, we own a bank right now that's at seventy percent of tangible <coughs> book value. Which is which bank? Uh, Standard Charter. Uh huh. Sure. And uh, recently, the the CEO of the company bought one hundred and forty thousand shares, and uh, six other five other insiders also bought stock, and. Uh, you know, it's at 10 times earnings, but the company used to earn 15% return on equity. If they get back there, we'd be buying it at around five times earnings. So that's, that's just one. Right. That's one. You know, I'm reminded. It's a, it's a basket was, approach. Right. When I was growing up, um, I would sit around sometimes when my parents had folks over and my father having been in the business, someone would say, Howard, give me a stock. And he'd look at them and say, save your money. 
And I used to think for a long time he's just kind of an unfriendly guy. But the root of that response is it's not one stock. And I don't want to give somebody one stock. Mm -hmm. It's a portfolio that's built with these characteristics that earns that return. Any one of those can blow up in your face. But the probabilities are if you own a portfolio of those, lots of those, on average you're going to be a winner as opposed to a loser. But you don't know which one is going to be the loser. And the last thing he ever wanted to do was give a friend a loser. So the last thing we really want to do is go on the air and give you a loser. What have you learned from your blow-ups? I mean, were there blow-ups, for instance, in the financial crisis, which of course happened to a lot of value managers. Uh, they underestimated uh, what was going on in the, you know, in the, in the financial crisis. So if, uh, lessons learned from the financial crisis or from any of your blow-ups? Well, I, um, then we're going to sound like there's a, any, there's a lack of humility. I think we were fortunate mm -hmm. um, because we didn't like the, the leverage in many of the financial companies prior to the blow up. And we didn't like the funding on a lot of those companies. So we had um, reduced our holdings in that area. And that, that, was a, that worked well. We were mm -hmm. fortunate in that regard. Even an insurer like AIG, I don't know if that was in your we didn't portfolio, own AIG. you didn't own it. No, we didn't own right. AIG. We, mm -hmm. just, we didn't understand CDS. We didn't understand we that for a form while. of insurance. We, we got out. While, but we got out. We got right. Out. When it started getting into these derivatives right. and yep. that kind yes. of stuff. Um, right. Didn't make sense. So is, is that one of the kind of one of the hallmarks of your approach is if we don't understand it, we're not going to buy into that business? I think, well, I think it's very hard to, to get deeply inside any financial right. company. You do, you do the best you can. You look at, you know, a bank, you look at the tier one capital ratio and things right. like that and how they, how they reserve for loans and other things. But, but I think you, you got to take, take into consideration that it's one of many, many issues and, and, and that you're buying a, a group of stocks, a basket of stocks with the, the advantages of the law of large numbers. Warren Buffett has been, you know, very generous in his compliments about Jeff Bezos. They, Berkshire Hathaway has purchased Amazon. What are you doing at Tweety Brown? Are you buying any of the fangs? Do you own any of them? We've, well, um, we have owned Google for years. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and what was it about Google that attracted you? Again, I, I don't think typically that as being uh, the area that a value investor would have purchased or a well, they, domi that you they dominated with. search, and search was clearly right. a, an industry, a business that was growing, and they were monetizing that um, that aspect of their business very nicely. And that was a point in time I can't remember exactly which year well, it was. The stock was way down; it, it made cheap. no sense. It was so cheap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. It with was a good 12, business. It was twelve times after tax earnings, is what we were paying. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but that that assumed you you were buying the whole company and subtracting cash. Uh, you were getting the, you were t paying yourself back the cash in the, in the till and your net price for the earnings power of Google was about 12 times after tax earnings. And the earnings were, were understated because they're all their moonshot type things that were losing money and they were clearly not related to the core business. Right. Uh, so you, you, you had that as almost a hidden asset there and uh, it was growing at about 20% a year and it looked like it would continue for a while. So it, it met some quantitative value standards. I think the analyst uh, valued it at about 12 times pre-tax EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes, and uh, we were buying it at about 80% right. of that figure. Uh, should have owned more. We should have owned <laughs> Darn. <laughs> There is much more firepower being uh, aimed at the analyzing the market. For instance, there are so many more, you know, CFAs. There are, are so much more money. There's so much big data analyzing every stock, every which way. Is it getting harder, Will, to be to do what you do, to to actually to, to find opportunities that are not being found by other money managers? I don't know whether it's getting harder. I would say, and this is, almost sounds like a cliche, but I, I don't think necessarily that more data brings more judgment. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I think there is a judgment aspect to all of this. And I do think that there just is this behavioral aspect to the way people function in markets. All you have to do is look at the stock market from day to day and, and walk away and saying, well, was, was yesterday the efficient market or is today the efficient market? And I think it's very hard for most people to distance themselves from that sort of pressure. Um, How do you do you're, it? You're in Wall Street. How do you distance yourself? Well, it's just what your antenna are tuned for and what you, what you, think, is, what you think is relevant. Um, I do find the news interesting. I don't want to get into it. Um, but a lot of what goes on in the world just isn't relevant to what we're trying to do from an investment perspective. Um, you just try and... I don't think this is actually a terribly complicated business. Um, you don't have to be a scientist. You know, the really smart or an guys, astrophysicist they're the or ones who land things on the moon or Saturn. Mm -hmm. Those are the really smart people. I think what you need is a, is a framework to keep you anchored as close to objectivity as you can possibly get and, and stay with that. It helps keep your head clear. Mm -hmm. John, would you agree? I would agree. I mean, I think that uh, the concept of having two prices, the stock price and then the, the, the value, real, real world value, you know, net cash or value of the earning power based on investment banking type uh, rules of thumb. Uh, that's, that's, that's great. And you of, often with some of these stocks end up with owner earnings, a good owner earnings yield. You pay 10 times earnings for a business, you're getting a 10% earnings earnings yield on your price. And many of our, our companies, when we buy them, have that, that characteristic. So you make it sound so simple. <laughs> it isn't, but at any rate, you do. It That's is. why I have no gray hair. <laughs> the concept is inherently simple. It is, inherently yeah. simple. Yeah. It really is. It is. Will, you've said that you wouldn't recommend one stock. You didn't mm -hmm. want to, that your, as your dad would say, you know, save. <laughs> I'm not going to give you one stock. However, on Wealth Track, which you knew, we do have a, we ask a question of each of our guests, if there's one investment we should all own some of in a long-term diversified portfolio, what would it be? Other than Tweety Brown funds. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. You're not allowed to recommend your that. own <laughs> cooking. Oh, right. Gosh. Well, in asset class, it's equities. Mm -hmm. There's no question about equities. And the reason I say that as opposed to other asset classes is businesses in many ways are organic. They're comprised of um, human capital, financial capital, and physical capital. And they're adaptive. And the idea that your business, because the world changes. Think back 20 years ago, how we all communicated, where we are today. Mm -hmm. Businesses have the ability because of the human capital, the financial capital, intellectual capital, to adapt and evolve. And that's one of the nice things about businesses. They're sort of, if you will, almost living organisms. Mm -hmm. And you have a better chance of seeing the real purchasing power of your capital grow. In doing that, you've won, you've got to extend your time horizon. You're better off not looking at the price of your stocks every day because it'll drive you virtually insane. Right. And don't spend too much time anchoring on the last piece of news, which what everybody does. Extend your thinking out, try and put things into a context, and ask yourself, where are we likely to be doing this in five or 10 years, remembering why you're trying to save some money? So that's his response. What's your response to the question? <laughs> you contradict me. <laughs> no, I don't have to. I mean, if I have to. <laughs> you have to, John. All right. Well, maybe have some Berkshire Hathaway. Put some of that in there. It's diversified. And uh, they're certainly trying to beat the index. And uh, hopefully they will. <laughs> we don't own a lot of it. All right. We'll leave it there. John Spears. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us from Tweedy Brown. And Will Brown, thank you as well for the two of you joining us. We really thank appreciate you. it. Thank, thank you, you for a very appreciate interesting the time. interview. Thank yep. you.
the close of every wealth track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is take a duo of Buffett biographies on vacation. I have recommended Buffett, The Making of an American Capitalist by Roger Lowenstein several times before. It is a fascinating exploration of Buffett's early interest and obsession with investing and making money in his career decisions until the mid-1990s. The second book, The Snowball, Warren Buffett and the Business of Life by Alice Schroeder, is a whole other study of Buffett personally. Although he authorized it, it evidently got a little too personal for his taste. Together, they give a pretty complete picture of who this investing master is and how he has achieved what he has. Well, next week, great value investor Tom Russo has been following Warren Buffett's investment principles since 1984 at his Semper Vic Partners funds. Berkshire Hathaway is his largest holding. Does Buffett's advice still work? In this week's extra feature, guests Will Brown and John Spears share their techniques to keep fresh and energized over a lifetime of investing. And please continue to keep us energized and challenged with your Facebook postings and tweets and watch us anytime on our YouTube channel. Thank you for watching. Have a wonderful Father's Day weekend. We pay tribute to all dads past and present and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. Funding provided by Clearbridge Investments, a leg mason company, Thornburg Investment Management, Active Management, Flexible Perspective. Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences, and the Fairholme Foundation.